Now it is my pleasure to introduce the first Gardner Lecture today. Dr. Harvey Alter, distinguished NIH investigator, graduated from medical school at the University of Rochester and states that subsequently he became involved in research serendipitously through a series of fortuitous, unexpected events. As a research fellow at the NIH in the 1960s, his first project resulted in the discovery of the Australia antigen and later his mentor, the Nobel laureate Baruch Bloomberg, showed that this antigen was associated with human hepatitis and others showed that it represented the surface protein of hepatitis B virus. This was the first known serum marker for viral hepatitis and became the basis for the hepatitis B vaccine. After completing his residency in internal medicine and fellowship in hepatology, Dr. Alter returned to the NIH to pick up on the hepatitis story. There he discovered that 30 percent of, multi uh, of multiple transfused cardiac surgery patients developed hepatitis, a risk associated with paid donor blood transfusion. In this co cohort, he discovered non-A, non-B viral hepatitis, later identified by Michael Houghton and co-workers and Daniel Brad Bradley, who we'll hear from this morning as well as the Gardner Laureate from the CDC, they recognize this as hepatitis C. Dr. Alter and his colleagues found that donor screening for hepatitis C reduced the risk of viral transmission by over 90% and subsequent standard screening has reduced this risk to near zero. He has pursued groundbreaking long-term prospective studies in this very important field. Today, Dr. Alter will present his Gairdner lecture, Hepatitis C, From Hippocrates to Cure. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Whiteside, for giving my Gairdner lecture. <laughs> uh, and thank you to the Gairdner Foundation. This is a, <coughs> a wonderful <coughs> few me tribute. I'm losing my voice. I hope I'll make it. Um, so these days, especially in the U.S., uh, one always has to begin their talks with a financial disclosure. However, people who work at NIH only dream about having financial disclosures. So wait, this just in. Congress has just sequestered dreaming. So I have nothing financial, but I do have some disclosures. First, as you know, <clears throat> light travels faster than sound. That is why I will appeal bright, oh man. <laughs> Don't want to do that. I'm sorry, <laughs> messed up that joke. This is, I'm not gonna use the, this, oh, come on, go back. Let me go back. All right, just let me go. I'm not gonna go back here. Okay, I'm gonna use pointers here. Anyway. My second one you've already seen, but uh, as you know, I'm not really bald. Uh, I'm a hair donor. Uh, but this the important disclosure is that nothing I say reflects the position of the U.S. government, which instantly gives it great credibility and, and relevance. Also, my memory is not as sharp as it used to be, and also my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. <laughs> Now, what I'm going to try to do today is go through 2,000 years of hepatitis history uh, leading up to Dan Bradley. Uh, and this history really began with Hippocrates, the father of medicine, back around 400 BC. And Hippocrates was a great observer, and he observed uh, that patients uh, often got yellow, and he termed this icterus. He was the first to observe hardening of the liver, which he called kiros. Uh, so he was a great observer, but, but not a very good speller. Uh, but Hippocrates also gave us the uh, medical oath, which said, physician, first do no harm. But he also said, physician, second, get paid up front and do not take Medicare. <laughs> Now, nothing much happened over the next 2,000 years, uh, but there were uh, a lot of wars. And in every war, it was noted that a huge number of soldiers came down with yellow jaundice. Uh, this was, in, in fact, called campaign jaundice. Uh, there was also vaccine-induced jaundice from shared needle exposures. Uh, 
In World War II, 50,000 soldiers were infected with yellow fever uh, by yellow fever vaccine and got hepatitis B. But in this period uh, of, of the Second World War particularly, they distinguished hepatitis A, the infectious form, uh, from hepatitis B, the serum form. But nothing definitive really happened until the early 1960s, uh, when, I was, uh, Dr. White said, I said, I was fortuitous to be in the laboratory of Dr. Bush Bloomberg. and was the first to observe this red precipitin line, uh, which uh, subsequently became, uh, was identified as the surface protein of the hepatitis B virus, and then called the hepatitis B surface antigen. Uh, though originally we called this the red antigen because of the staining characteristics of this line, then the Australian antigen for the person in whom it was found. This is a reaction between, <coughs> excuse me, an Australian Aborigine and a multi multiply transfused uh, patient, uh, and detected by a simple technique like agar gel diffusion. Uh, so insensitive that we would not think about using, using this technique today but there was so much surface antigen present uh, that one could detect it by this very simplistic method. In any event, uh, I'm not gonna be able to tell you the hepatitis B story, there isn't enough time. But when I, after finishing my clinical training uh, in internal medicine and hematology, I came back to NIH. Uh, by this time, the Australian antigen had been identified as the hepatitis B virus, and I came back to study uh, transfusion-associated hepatitis, uh, doing prospective studies of open-heart surgery patients who were getting a, a lot of blood. As shown in the squares, an average of 17 units of blood per case. The first thing that was found was this inordinately high rate of hepatitis. About 30% of people getting open-heart surgery uh, were getting hepatitis, most of it anecteric. And that's because they were getting a lot of blood, but mostly is shown on the right because we were using a lot of paid donor blood. And studies showed that if you got at least one unit of paid donor blood, commercial blood, you had a 50% chance of getting hepatitis. Whereas if you got only volunteer blood, donor blood, you had only a 7% chance. So in 1970, uh, we, uh, felt we could no longer tolerate using this paid blood, so we went to an all-volunteer donor system, but we simultaneously introduced the first-generation test for hepatitis B, again using agar gel diffusion because there was nothing else at that, at that point. But these two factors together caused this precipitous fall in post-transfusion hepatitis, about a 70% reduction, which was primarily due to the change in the donor source. That was the key. And nothing we've ever done since that time, including hepatitis C testing, has had as much impact because there was so much hepatitis out there at that point. So our rates had settled down uh, after 1970 to around 10%. Uh, and then a, uh, Abbott developed a more sensitive test for hepatitis B uh, and we took out the stored uh, frozen samples and we tested them by this more sensitive test. And we were somewhat surprised that of the total hepatitis, hepatitis B uh, accounted for only about 30%. Uh, so there was now this non-B entity. Uh, and at that time, only two known viruses. Uh, but Feinstone and Kapikian and Purcell from uh, right to left uh, discovered the hepatitis A virus around 1975 using immune electron microscopy. Uh, these are my collaborators. We originally uh, immediately sent our samples to Steve Feinstone, uh, and he tested these non-B cases, and not a single case uh, was hepatitis A. And it was then in a rather brilliant state of deductive reasoning that we said if these cases were not A, and we're not B, that we would call this non-A, non-B hepatitis. Uh, we did this actually, we thought of calling it hepatitis C at that point, but uh, we hadn't yet proven that it was a virus, and if it was, we didn't know how many agents might be involved. 
So we used that cautious and, uh, and we were kind of cocky thinking that we would discover this virus within a very short time and we changed the name to C. Uh, as you know, that did not happen. But we now had non-A, non-B, and then the next step was to prove its transmissibility. Uh, so we took samples from these patients uh, in various and from donors, and we inoculated them into chimpanzees. Uh, nowadays, we can no longer do chimpanzee research, but the animals really love to be in experiments. They uh, lined up uh, to participate. <laughs> Uh, we inoculated the first five of these chimps with, the, with these samples. The last chimp was actually uh, named after me. It was a chimp Harvey, uh, and I always kept him as the uninoculated control. <laughs> uh, but all five of these chimps were, uh, came down with hepatitis. They didn't develop clinical hepatitis, but they had enzyme elevations and liver histology changes. Uh, I won't show you that data, but what was important is that we could transmit hepatitis, not just from people with acute hepatitis, but from people with chronic hepatitis that was mostly asymptomatic, and particularly from donors who were totally asymptomatic, but had been implicated in transmitting hepatitis to, uh, to patients. At that point in the story, a famous patient came in, uh, Mr. H. And Mr. H, uh, who actually died of his hepatitis, uh, died uh, at age 92 with hepatitis C, totally asymptomatic, uh, died from heart disease, but uh, we studied him for almost 30 years. Uh, but initially, Mr. H, who liked to climb mountains, uh, not high mountains, but he liked to blaze trails, uh, and one time while out on a, uh, uh, on a mountaintop, uh, passed out and turned blue uh, and would have died except that his wife was with him. Uh, she administered CPR and saved him. Uh, he then uh, got his way to NIH where he's found to have triple vessel coronary artery disease and he was one of the early uh, triple bypass operations uh, at NIH. Uh, shown here are, uh, is his clinical course. In blue are the ALT elevations. And you see about six weeks after receiving uh, 19 units of blood, his ALT began to rise. Um, and shown in the yellow line is a retrospective testing of HCV RNA. So you can see as is typical, RNA appears uh, before the ALT elevations. Uh, you can see that his, uh, his ALT, his RNA peak went up to three times 10 to the seven copies per ml. Uh, but what was critical here is that I obtained an apheresis unit from this patient at point A when his HCV RNA was at its peak. Uh, and that material was put into a chimp and that chimp developed hepatitis. Uh, another apheresis was obtained at point B at the peak of his ALT elevation. That was put into a chimp and it was not infectious. What was different between these two time points, they were only 12 days apart, but what was different was that his viral load was beginning to decline rapidly and as shown as the yellow bar, he had now developed antibody to hepatitis C, so most of his virus was immune complex and was less infectious because of that. This shows the immune complex, uh, you don't need to pay attention to that. But what was critical uh, was that Bob Purcell uh, performed a uh, dilution series of the sample from point A and titered this in chimpanzees. And we found that the chimpanzee titer was one times 10 to the 6.5 chimp infectious doses, so almost identical to the patient's own genomic titer. But now we had a, a titered infectious inoculum and we had a chimpanzee model. Uh, so then you could do additional things. So what Steve Feinstone did was he took uh, the H sample uh, and he did a chloroform extraction and that was inoculated to a chimpanzee shown on the bottom. That did not cause hepatitis, but a sham extraction shown on the top did cause hepatitis. And this showed 
that there was essential lipid uh, in this agent, uh, which made it uh, probable that it was an enveloped agent. agent uh, and uh, Dan Bradley had done similar studies and also showed it was an enveloped agent. Um, and then we were also able uh, to do filtration studies uh, using this sort of cumbersome model, but you could pass the material through different size filters. This was done in Dr. Purcell's lab, and then take the filtrate and inoculate the chimpanzee. We found that the virus passed through a 100 nanometer, 80 nanometer, 50 nanometer filter. Uh, it was still infectious, but was blocked by a 30 nanometer filter. So this allowed us to postulate what this agent might look like uh, and be before we had ever seen it, before we had any tests for it, before we knew there was an antibody. Uh, uh, and so we knew then it was a small lipid encapsulated agent, which kind of narrowed the field down that it would either be uh, what we then call toga viruses, but these small RNA viruses, either now alpha viruses or flaviviruses, uh, or it could have been a hepatinovirus, a hepatitis B-like virus, but we had a lot of evidence that it was unrelated to B or to the Delta agent. So it was either kind of between a flavivirus or a totally new uh, viral class. Uh, Dan Bradley, I believe, was the first to say that this had the characteristics of a flavivirus, uh, which, which proved to be the case. So in addition to knowing a lot now about what the virus might be, uh, very importantly, clinically, we knew that it caused silent, persistent infection in the majority of patients, and we knew that it could be transmitted from the blood of totally asymptomatic chronic carriers. Now, at that point, we wanted to do clinical studies. Our early liver biopsy techniques were, were rather crude, uh, but we uh, obtained a lot of inf information from these. Uh, this was done with Jay Hoofnagel's group and his many, many fellows. Uh, this was before Jordan Feld's time, but uh, Jordan became one of Jay's great fellows. Uh, but what we found uh, that when we initially biopsied 39 patients, uh, and 10% of them already had cirrhosis at the time of uh, the first biopsy. 13% had severe chronic active hepatitis, uh, which could become cirrhosis. And indeed, when we re-biopsied these patients, particularly those who had the more severe initial uh, biopsies, we found that 30% actually seemed to improve, maybe just sampling error. 45% uh, were stable. But another 25% had progressive disease. We wound up with eight patients out of 39 or 20% who developed cirrhosis uh, from non-A, non-B, and that figure has held up over the years. Uh, hepatitis C causes about cirrhosis about 20%, maybe 30%. And we found that some of these patients died. A lot of people thought this was a, a benign transaminitis, uh, but this, this was a potentially uh, fatal disease. So we had answered a lot of questions already, but there were, there were some questions that were even more imponderable than non-A, non-B. Uh, for instance, uh, if a man speaks in a forest and a woman is not there to hear him, is he still wrong? <laughs> we, we now know the answer to this. <laughs> or do children, do infants have as much fun in infancy as adults do in adultery? <laughs> These are just some things to think about. <laughs> so getting back to the transfusion story, I left you off around 1975 with the discovery of HAV, the definition of non-A, non-B. In late 70s, we had a rise in, in non-A, non-B hepatitis for reasons which aren't clear. And also shown in the blue, we had a lot of cases of CMV hepatitis, which was due to the use of fresh blood drawn the day of surgery. Uh, with, with leukocytes. Uh, but then our levels kind of stabled, uh, stabilized at around 5 to 6%. In 1981, based on retrospective data we had from this cohort, we had postulated that ALT testing of donors might reduce hepatitis by about 30%. So we instituted ALT screening of donors, but we couldn't show any impact of that. 
Then in 85, uh, AIDS came along, uh, an anti-HIV testing. We thought this would serve as a surrogate marker uh, for a non-A, non-B, uh, but it did not. It did not seem to have an impact, and mostly because the, most of the people found with HIV early on were from gay communities, and gays do not have a particularly high rate of hep hepatitis C. It's the drug addicts who do. Then we did another retrospective test to show that anti-core testing, hepatitis B core testing, might serve as a surrogate for non-A, non-B, uh, and uh, predicted again a 30 to 40 percent reduction. When we introduced that test, uh, the whole country introduced it in 1987, our rates did indeed go down by uh, 25 to 30 percent, and came down about 4.1 percent by 1989. Now at that point, all through this time, we had tried every serologic technique that we could imagine to look for this non-A, non-B agent. But it's hard to find an antigen when you don't have the antibody. It's hard to find an antibody when you don't have the antigen. Uh, molecular biology was just, just emerging at that time. And we had done some work with Steve Feinstone on uh, 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 subtractive uh, hybridization, uh, but it hadn't panned out. So in 1989, uh, I wrote a poem on, on this frustration of uh, not finding this agent over all this time. And I, I called the poem, I Can't See the Forest for the HBAGs. And it went, I think that I shall never see this virus called non-A, non-B, a virus I cannot deliver, and yet I know it's in the liver, a virus that we often blame but which exists alone by name. No antigen or DNA, no little test to mark its way. A virus which in our confusion has forced us into mass collusion to make exist just by exclusion. Oh, great liver in the sky, show us where and tell us why. Send us thoughts that will inspire us. Let us see this elusive virus. If we don't publish soon, they're going to fire us. <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop at that point. So at that point, un unbeknownst uh, to me, uh, uh, Dan Bradley, and Michael Houghton, and the Chiron group were secretly working in the back spaces of Chiron. Uh, trying cloning, uh, and Dan will tell you the story of, of how they cloned the hepatitis C virus. Uh, at that point, actually, I wrote another poem on how I did not clone the hepatitis C virus, which I call, There's No Sense Chiron Over Spilt Milk. <laughs> but I'm not going to read that one. <laughs> In any event, when, when Chiron and Dan made this discovery, George Quo called me and he asked for the, uh, what it called the infamous altar panel. This was a very small panel of highly pedigreed samples where every positive had been proven infectious in the chimp, where every negative had been from persons who had been donors and had, had donated at least 10 times and never transmitted hepatitis, and where every sample was there in random duplicate. Uh, George, uh, I, I sent the panel to George, and he sent back the answer the next day. Uh, and then I, I had already been through 19 other people who said they had the non-A, non-B virus, so I didn't think this was going to amount to anything. And I didn't look at the code very rapidly. George kept calling me up, calling me to break the code. Uh, well, I finally did, and sure enough, they, they broke the panel perfectly. Uh, they found all three chronic uh, non-A, non-B cases to be positive in the six duplicate samples. They found two implicated donors to be positive in the four uh, samples. They didn't find an acute non-A, non-B to be positive because they were find, looking for antibody, uh, and it hadn't yet developed, but these two patients were subsequently seroconverted. And importantly, all the negative controls uh, were negative in both duplicate samples. Uh, so at that point, uh, I was convinced. We went to 15 of our best non-A, non-B cases, uh, all 15 seroconverted for hepatitis C in temporal relationship to their 
hepatitis. Uh, we then looked at the donors to 25 such cases. Uh, we found a positive donor in 80% of these cases by first generation test. It went up to 88% by a second generation test. So it looked like if we introduced this test, uh, we could reduce post transfusion hepatitis by about 90%. Uh, and indeed, that's what happened. The test was introduced in 1990. Uh, and you see the rates went down from 4.1% to 1.1%, uh, which represented only one case of, non of hepatitis C. The second generation test came along in 1992. And by 1997, uh, we had reached virtual zero. Now, the number isn't really zero. The, the risk of transmitting hepatitis C now is about one in two million. Uh, but compare that to one in three when this study started. Uh, now, this is that same data uh, with just this downward arrow. And I, I show this because this is not just a story of post-transfusion hepatitis. Uh, this is a story of my life. And as you see, both post-transfusion hepatitis and my life are on this very rapid <laughs> decline. And I'm just uh, very pleased that the virus is disappearing and I'm still up here talking about it. Just to give you a little bit of sense of the impact, if we took our, our uh, incidence figures from 1970s and, and 1980s of 10% and then 6% and multiplied that by the number of recipients in the country, uh, these are US figures alone, we calculate that Transfusion may have caused near 5 million cases of hepatitis in those two decades. And if 80% became chronic and 20% developed cirrhosis, this had the potential to cause 768,000 cases of cirrhosis. Now, it didn't cause that many because cirrhosis took a long time to develop and many of these patients died of their other diseases. But it had that potential. Uh, and even if these numbers were half that, half that amount, uh, it was still very huge. Now, in the 1990s, if we hadn't introduced the test, when the rates were down to 4% uh, and would have stayed at 4%, another 1.2 million cases uh, might have happened from transfusion and another 192,000 cases of potential cirrhosis. Uh, so the, the impact was, was quite large. Now, just uh, I'm presenting my research, I, I thought it was only fair that you should know my general research philosophy, and that is to steal from one is plagiarism, but to steal from many is research. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just want to go into a little bit of clinical uh, data. Uh, this, uh, at least Gary would know, this is a liver. Uh, and there's two things characteristic of hepatitis C. Uh, one is that it causes persistent infection in 75 to 85 percent of, of, of people who get it. And the second is that it has this, it progresses, it can progress from uh, a liver that has chronic hepatitis of various degrees to cirrhosis, and within the cirrhosis you can get hepatocellular carcinoma. But the point I want to make is that this progression is not linear, not at all, and that most patients get hung up here with no fibrosis or stage one or two fibrosis, at least over the time we have followed them. Uh, so th those are the two critical points about hepatitis C. So why does it become persistent in so many people? Well, one of the main factors is that when you have hepatitis C, you don't have a hepatitis C virus you have a whole family of closely related variants, a swarm of hepatitis C viruses that's called the viral quasi-species. Uh, and these, uh, although they only differ by a few nucleotides from each other, uh, they can be immunologically distinct. So we're working with Patricia Farsi, one of my uh, main collaborators. Uh, she cloned uh, from Mr. Hutchinson, this patient H, who doesn't, didn't mind my using his name, did 105 clones from a single sample. And you can see here that 57% of the clones were identical. But at the same time, in a single sample, there were 19 other variants already present. So that even if one mounted a strong immune response against the dominant strain, any one of these other strains uh, would have been capable of becoming the new dominant strain. 
Uh, and we sh this is shown in this slide where with Patricia we took samples during the uh, evolution of acute hepatitis in, in a prospectively followed patient where we had weekly samples and, and did 10 clones at each of these points with the arrows. You can see that at week three, there were three sort of co-dominant strains, arbitrarily labeled A, B, and C. That by week eight, strain D was now the dominant strain, and there's also E, F, and G. By week 13 now, you could see A was still there, but there was H, I, J, K all the way up to P. And the reason there were more variants at this point, at week 13 versus eight, is that antibody had developed in between these now, and the antibody was putting immune pressure and driving the viral variation further. And by week 16, we had gotten through almost an entire alphabet of newly evolving uh, strains of hepatitis C. Uh, so in a very simplistic way, uh, I, I, I saw, uh, summarizing the natural history of uh, viral host interactions, I apologize to Frank Chisari and others Jake Liang uh, uh, for the simplicity of this, but I think it's instructive of why the virus persists so well. One of the things that gives the virus a huge advantage is that it replicates so rapidly. It has a doubling time of 13 to 17 hours. So the virus reaches peak tighter within one to two weeks of becoming infected, reaching usual 10 to the five to 10 to the eight copies per ml. This rapid viral load gives the virus a huge advantage because the immune response isn't coming up until here, the T cells. So when the T cells come out, they're fighting against a massive viral load, massive viral proteins, and they become blunted. Then we have this evolving quasi-species, and this virus is producing a lot of protein, but particularly the core protein and the non-structural proteins have inhibitory effects, particularly on the first immune response, the innate immune response. And it's been shown that the, the viral proteins inhibit this innate immune response at very many levels, prevent the production of interferon, uh, the first host uh, defense system, uh, but they also directly inhibit the T cells, so we have uh, T cell blunting or energy uh, now, in the normal cir circumstances, the T cells would produce perforins and fast ligands and interferon gamma, and that would help rid the virus. But if these are blunted, and then you have the antibody, uh, sorry, the antibody, so in the, in the absence of a T cell response, the antibody, instead of helping to clear the virus, actually drives the vi viral variation further. But if everything was working right, if the perforins were coming out, you would narrow the quasi-species, and we've shown this in some patients, and eventually you'd go on to recovery. But generally, it drives the quasi-species variation further, and then the battle is lost. So these are the clinical roots of hepatitis C, and there are three, three main, main courses. Uh, the majority of patients have this chronic, stable, slowly progressive course, like Mr. H, uh, and do well over a long time. Uh, the second group has a more severe and progressive course where they may develop cirrhosis in 15 to 40 years. That's about 20 to 30 percent of the patients. And the last group, uh, the minority, uh, about 5 percent, will develop cirrhosis very rapidly in 5 to 10 years. These are patients who have confounding uh, variables, particularly uh, immunodeficiency like HIV, uh, co-infections with hepatitis B, and particularly alcoholism or now Seattle hepatitis. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to show you the data on alcohol, but it's very strong. Uh, I'll show that tomorrow, in fact. Uh, but I did want to show you this one slide of ethnicity uh, versus an alcohol, uh, wherein a uh, French person says, I'm tired and I'm thirsty. I must have wine. And a German person says, I'm tired and I'm thirsty. I must have beer. A Jewish person says, I'm tired and I'm thirsty. I must have diabetes. <laughs> so, so, I'm Jewish, so I feel like. So. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, let's speed up. Okay, okay. Uh, 
I, I, I won't go through this. Uh, I'll tell this tomorrow about, uh, but uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is a major uh, outcome now of hepatitis C. And it's extremely interesting, but it's predicted now if we don't do something about hepatitis C, the rates of hepatocellular carcinoma are going to, they've already tripled uh, in, in the two decades from the 19, late 70s, they've already tripled. It's predicted that if there's no change in the standard of care, uh, cases of decompensated cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, liver transplantation are going to increase at least fourfold over the next 10 years. Unfortunately, things are changing. Treatments are here now that uh, even two years ago were giving sustained virologic responses around 50%. Now there are new protease inhibitors which added to interferon and ribavirin. Uh, if you look at this, the 24-week point, uh, compared to interferon and ribavirin alone, if you add this protease inhibitor, the sustained virologic response rate goes up to 75%. That's now a cure rate. Uh, that's where we are right now. New drugs are coming that, uh, that, can be, that are gonna be interferon-free, that will have efficacies of over 90%, which is maybe 12 weeks of therapy. Uh, so the CDC strategy, now that we have new good treatments, are that we have to find these people. We have to find these silent carriers, and they're targeting uh, the baby boomers, uh, people uh, born between 1945 and 65. And the strategy now is to test and treat, and the thought is that if we can find them, we can cure them. So, if I can just take another minute, John. <laughs> okay, but if we had 100 people in this room who got infected, 80 would have a persistent infection, 30 of those uh, would be stable, uh, uh, and 70% would have this variable course. Now, with new treatments, 70% uh, would be cured. So if you take the group, we'd have 20% who spontaneously recovered, 24 who'd do well if you treat them or not, 39 who'd be treatment cures, so you'd have a favorable outcome in 83%, uh, and only 17%, uh, if they don't have confounders, would, would have a bad outcome, and if we go up to 90% efficacy, only 6%. So there is a paradox, though, that though these treatments are great on an individual basis, uh, there are so many people who are infected with hepatitis C, and many of whom won't have access to treatment. That is, it's a huge, huge global problem. So I'm gonna skip through this. <laughs> but just to leave you with this last uh, thought, that we've been through this government shutdown in the U.S. Uh, government workers have gotten a bum rap. Uh, but I just want you to know that I, myself, always have given 100% at work. It's just that it has a peculiar distribution. Uh, so, so, so uh, let's say Thursday is one of my fair days. So sorry to go over, but thank you very much.